Good afternoon, everybody. I am Lisa Jones. I'm the program coordinator with West Virginia University under the Small Farm Center. And this is the six weeks mini series designed to increase, hopefully, your marketing knowledge and effective marketing strategies, affordable strategies, hopefully as well, that you can use at farmers markets and in conjunction with your business to hopefully increase your sales. So that's our goal with all of this. Um, I do want to recognize our funders as we move forward with this and give them a big thank you to help making the mini grants portion of the mini series possible. We also, or I also want to thank our partner organization, which is the West Virginia Farmers Market Association, who's going to be managing mini grants for the project. And that really helps reduce the paperwork burden for all of the producers that are participating. So as participants of the mini, -ser mini series, uh, we have a variety of classes or webinars that we're offering. Um, and there is a little outline here of some of the things that we plan on going over. Today's topic is really incorporating marketing into your business plan, which is really a critical piece, even if it's not visually nearly as stimulating as like creating a display, but we'll get there. Um, we will be soon announcing some workshops that are gonna happen uh, later on. And I encourage you to participate in those. I'm considering giving out the book that I'm gonna keep referencing today. So if you're wanting these workshops to happen in your area, you can put in the chat where you're located. And that way we have a better idea of where we should be concentrating the trainings. So as we move forward with the topic today, I do have one particular poll question that I am going to go ahead and launch now. It's actually two particular questions, but one is, do you have a business plan for your farm? This is gonna help me read the room because a lot of this is marketing. I mean, the whole thing is marketing plans and business plans. And I just need to know upfront how like in depth I should cover this <laughs> because I can talk about business plans for a while, but not everybody gets super excited about them. So do you have a business plan? And it can be super simple, or it can be something 50 pages that you would take to a bank. Maybe it won't be that thick, but but still, it could be one way or the other, any kind of business plan that you might have. And then also marketing. My assumption is that you are either considering being a farmer's market vendor or you're actively a farmer's market vendor. So do you have a marketing plan in place? So those are my questions. If you can go ahead and put your response into the poll that should have popped up, hit submit, and then it'll come into my end. That is extremely helpful for me. Okay. I am waiting on just a couple more people. Uh, depending on if you're on the phone, you can either chime in or if you want, if you have the ability to put something in the text box, that's perfectly fine too. But I'm gonna move this on. Is, yeah, go ahead. This is Sarah. I I don't have a specific written marketing plan. That's something I would love to develop. Perfect. Excellent. And that's why I'm hoping everyone is here is because you want to learn about this and want to develop these things. Oh, oh. also, I want to make sure I go ahead and toss this in the chat from last week <clears throat> and all of these recordings. I am live streaming these on Facebook. So you can go to our Small Farm Center Facebook page and find the recording. Or if you're not a Facebook user, which is perfectly fine, um, and you do have access to the internet, you can also find our recordings on YouTube. It is under WVU Extension, well, WVU Extension Experts is technically where the sub group is. Um, and I'm just putting a link into the chat box of where all of the recordings for this mini series is, as well as other recordings that you might be interested in. Um, and then I think we are also probably gonna put them on the Farmers Market Association YouTube channel in the future as well. So you'll have multiple places you can go to find these recordings if you wanna come back and reference them later. Don't have an official business plan, but you have a model. Hey, that is perfectly fine. That is, that is really good to have in place. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and end that poll. 
So it looks like most people do not have a business plan and do not have a marketing plan. So that's perfect. Thanks for being here. I hopefully, hopefully I can teach you something by the end and not overwhelm you too, too much. So feel free to ask questions, use that chat box as much as you want, and feel free to follow up with me afterwards as well. So just real quick, a little background on me. I'm the host for this. But at the same time, today, I'm actually going to be giving you this particular presentation. So in my current role, I'm the program coordinator for the Small Firm Center, and I've been here for almost nine years now. However, previously, I was a manager for a farmer's market. So specifically, I was at the Morgantown Farmer's Market. I was the manager there for four years, and I also occasionally acted as a farm worker for a variety of the vendors that were there during that time. Um, and during those four years, we ended up having a $16,000 budget, which I know is like a huge budget for a farmer's market, right? It's not actually, um, but it we eventually got there by implementing an application and a handful of fees. And I'll be honest, most of that did not go to my salary. Most of it went to advertising the actual farmer's market itself. Um, while I was there, we established a second market in the area, in an area that was defined as low access and a food desert within our community. So we had two totally different markets, very different personalities is what I like to tell people about markets and how they run, the people that go to them. And then by the time I was done, we had a half a million dollars in sales. So, if, and, and think about that for a second. We had a $16,000 budget and a half a million dollars was going back into the pockets of the vendors. So I say that to say, I know a little bit about this topic. <laughs> I have a passion for it, obviously. But also, I'm going to talk about competition today. And even though your neighbors might be your competitors, I assume a lot of times they're also going to be your friends. And competition is a good thing. So you don't, you don't end up with that much in sales by not having more people, more competition. And that is what we're going to get into and how to define your product, why there's competition, which is a good thing again but how to differentiate it from your neighbor who might have the exact same thing or something similar. We're gonna tell people it's not the exact same thing because it probably isn't. You bring different values. Okay, anyway, so that's the lens that I bring to the series. That's the lens that I bring as a person whenever you have a discussion with me. If you wanna follow up, we can do some one-on-one -on -one kind of consulting stuff later. Um, but just know, I was the manager. I was not the vendor at this market. So that is my particular experience. But I, I know the questions that were asked of me as a manager, and I know what I could answer. And part of that is the information that your market should collect and things that you should be collecting as a vendor as well to benefit not only your business, but the business, the market as a whole. So what in the world is the point of a business plan and why does marketing naturally fit into it? Well, a business plan really helps you as a farm get organized uh, it helps you ask for loans if you decide to do that and really plan for your future. So a lot of businesses fail because they don't actually plan on where they're going to go and how they're going to succeed. So these business plans, sometimes they're really significant documents and take a long time to write. But we today are going to go through a very simplistic business plan model that can help you make decisions and guide you some through some of the really the critical steps of a business plan without writing a 15 page document because that takes a lot of time. Sometimes your businesses change and I want to just give you the tools to just get started. So these are really foundational tools for a farm business. Um, they can be a combination of lots of different types of documents and come out into one comprehensive report. They can, a lot of times you can detail your marketing plan within your business plan and you want to develop this yourself. Um, you can use, you can consult with the Farmers Market Association. You can reach out to our farm management specialist through extension. You reach out to other business management professionals within your community. SBDC um, does a great job at uh, chatting with people at the local level and making sure some of the dis those decisions and some of the information that you need about your particular community, they can help you with that. So really it's a process of planning, but it really, really helps in the long run. 
So I want to encourage you to do that. And this marketing plan is a piece of your business plan, but it's really a roadmap to implementing all of the amazing ideas that you have, but also measuring what success looks like along the way for your business. So I understand that not everyone is profit motivated. Some people are socially motivated, but you still need to have it written down what success looks like for you, even if it's not necessarily uh, profit-based. <clears throat> so <sighs> I don't recommend you having somebody else write your business plan for you. I feel like it's a very personal process that you need to go through. And yes, you can use templates and I will recommend templates as part of this. Um, but but using like pre-programmed computer software that's out there and guessing at numbers and that kind of thing, the plan might end up useless for your particular business if you don't put a little bit of time and energy into it. So I know we are in the middle of the season and I probably should have done this before the season got started. But if you do have time on a day that it's raining <laughs> and you're not already doing something else, or you know what, do this in the winter, right? Do Sit down and do this in the winter when it makes sense. Um, but, but create this business plan, create a marketing plan, and it's not one size fits all. It is very individualized for your particular business. So as we think about creating this plan, we want to talk about what really describes your you as a business person, your values, who are the customers that you're trying to target, um, who's your competition, so maybe your neighbors, and then what are your strategies going to be to bring those customers in, and then importantly, what what's your budget going to look like for these activities? Because most people do not put a ton of money aside towards marketing. It just doesn't happen. Even though we know that marketing is essential, a lot of times it doesn't happen. So if you can, it's really good to learn about some of the future trends, have some knowledge about maybe your competitors um, and even, even what sets you apart from your competitors. What are those customers wanting? What do they need? How can you how can you provide a different type of product for that market? And I I mean, they could be all tomatoes, you know, there could be three different types of tomatoes at the market or more likely 10 types of tomatoes at the market. But how are you different from your competitor and how are we telling people that particular story? So part of this is called analyzing the market, right? And it's it's really just a risk mitigation strategy is is like the technical piece of it. But it is it is really important to consider. And I'm going to go ahead right now and toss into the chat box a book that I'm going to highly recommend for everyone. Again, if you want to participate in the in-person in workshops, I think I'm going to buy this book for anybody that wants to participate. Um, it's called Building a Sustainable Business, a Guide to Developing Business Plan for Farms and Rural Businesses. And I'm pulling some of the worksheets out of this book today, and I'm going to show them to you all. Um, this is a PDF you can download. You do not have to buy the full-on hard copy a spiral bound book if you don't want to. But I highly recommend um, that at various points you look at this. It's a very long book. It's like 200 plus pages, but it is so, it's such a good resource to have. Um, and you can just pull out various pieces as you have time to even consider it. Okay, real quick. The four P's of marketing. Those are important parts to talk about when we're thinking about our marketing plan and then how that works into our business plan. So that marketing strategy really is about defining the customer or the target market that you are, are you are growing that product for, uh, the pricing that's involved, and the promotion strategies to really target that market. Now, as a vendor at a farmer's market, some of that stuff is already kind of in place when it comes to these four P's, and I'm going to get to that. But marketing experts say that if you just are trying to sell a product without going to your customers first. It's not like build it and they will come. It is you're developing a product that may or may not sell because you didn't think about who actually comes to the farmer's market that you plan on selling at. So we see that a lot in farming where somebody is growing sweet corn and they don't think about where they're going to sell that sweet corn until the silk is showing. And that is not a great strategy 
<laughs> I've said this before, I will say it again. Do not do that. Uh, if you can plan on selling your product before you even grow it, that's the best strategy. Um, granted, a farmer's market is a little different and we understand that, but at the same time, you're going to think about those customers first and then hopefully decide on products that are appropriate to meet those customer needs. And we will talk about how to even segment those customers out. So it's very customer oriented. If you were not going to be customer oriented, I would tell you do not consider selling at a farmer's market. Farmer's markets are very much, I mean, you are actively engaging in markets, in marketing. So you have to be okay with that. Um, or we could talk about other distribution channels you could send your products through. It's okay. <laughs> uh, but we, those four P's. So product. What's the product that we're selling? Pricing. How are we pricing those products? Place. How and where are we selling? And for you all, it's going to be a, some, some sort of farmer's market. It could be a farm stand. It could be online. Whatever. Some form of farmer's market is my assumption since you're here. And then promotion. How are we actually promoting those products? And yeah, so we'll we'll go through all of those. So I'm going to break them down. So product, again, the worksheet that I'm referencing is part of that book. It's a SARE guide. It's excellent. Check it out when you have time. But this is one of the worksheets in the back that's super useful when it comes to thinking about your individual product. So this is usually an easy question, but you also want to take a step back and think about what is it really that you're producing? What is a product? You may be producing some particular type of specialty crop, but you also, especially at, since you're at a farmer's market, you are providing knowledge a lot of times to your customers. You're providing important information about that particular product. You might follow up with your customers with an annual newsletter or a monthly newsletter, you might have an annual workshop on your farm where you're inviting that public that you sell to, to learn new skills. Um, so you're really educating these community, uh, these consumers within your community. So you're really not just providing an individual product at a farmer's market. There is a whole huge amount of value that's there. Um, so you, you might think about yourself as like bundling a service along with a product. Um, and then, and then what is it, why, why is a customer going to come to you? What are they actually buying versus your neighbor? Are you taking advantage of seasonality with a greenhouse or a high tunnel? And then just overall, what are the benefits that you're bringing? Are you the only person at your farmer's market that produces carrots? Or you're the only one and you're maybe even your multi-county area that it's a cheese person. You're going to be highly, highly desirable. So for practical purposes in this case, we are gonna define a product as a commodity or because we're a farmer's market, a specialty crop. Um, so food products a lot of times, um, and then final consumer goods and then the services that go along with it. And during that planning process, I want you to think about the actual market that you're selling at either now or in the future. What size is it? What's the location of the market and eventually your customers? What are purchasing patterns and preferences that might pop up? So that is a good question to ask the market manager if your market has one, which I, again, encourage. That will help you really think about this customer profile of who you are actually selling to because customer research is really important and it really helps you create that marketing strategy and sometimes, and, and I know it's the product that people really get excited about. A lot of times that's why you're farming because maybe you love your grandmother's tomato and you want to, you know, keep using those seeds. And, and that's the port, part that might really inspire you and get you excited. But we also want to make sure that's what your customer wants and is what they're looking for. So maybe, you know, if you look at the sheet, we're going to break it down into appeals to segments? Is it easy for a competitor to in, um, to actually copy? So maybe you are selling this non-homogenized milk, you know, cream top milk uh, from your grass-fed cows, but really your customers are buying, 
they're coming to you because they want like an old fashioned taste. There might be some perceived health benefits there. They are wanting to support you as a local farm. Like those are some of the additional benefits that comes with a product that we want to make sure we are thinking about when it comes to the value. So for pricing, there's, there's a lot of ways <laughs> to think about pricing and how to price. And, and I mean, the basis is it's influenced by your production costs, what that looks like for you and your competition. Those are, they, they might be the same, but maybe not. But then also what is your customer willing to pay and what is that value that they put on it? So from a farm perspective, we want to make sure that we're covering all of our costs. And we also want to make sure that the profit in there is fair, but this will depend on a lot of, a lot of externalities. It depends on the actions of your competitors at the market, the demand for your product. So sometimes because there are so many tomatoes in August, people reduce the number of tomato, uh, the, the price on tomatoes, and that's going to influence your farm as well, even if your production cost doesn't change. Um, it, it, that might in, influence, maybe. <laughs> it depends on where you are. Uh, but there's all these different forces at work, right, that can influence price. And that has a lot of influences here. Again, I have a worksheet for you to work through some of this. <laughs> Uh, and, and, you know, honestly, that even it, it changes by season, but it even changes during the day. Like if you have a ton of tomatoes and we know they're perishable products that maybe you're not going to add value to later and you don't have a second outlet for them. If we know that over the day, that product is slowly perishing, right? Because it, it's pulled off the vine, um, maybe because we're trying to take advantage of the quality people might change their product prices throughout the day. Now, I'm not a huge fan of that particular strategy, but some people do it. <laughs> but we also don't want to waste our product if it's not sold. So that kind of goes into how you produce, what you produce, and having additional outlets beyond the farmer's market. Or, or how do you take advantage of the product at the farmer's market if you take it home? Are you canning it or what does that next step look like? Are you drying it? Are you freezing it to really take advantage of all of the stuff that you harvest? Because that is time and effort. And then your loyalty honestly changes the pricing sometimes that customers will pay because they look at your particular operation and the value that you're bringing through your production practices. And sometimes they'll pay more for that. So we talk about how. If you are USDA certified organic or you're under the certified naturally grown program or you have another label that you assign with your farm, maybe tell, you know, you're no spray or there's all of these labels that people will give to their farm. And sometimes that also uh, changes market price and what people are willing to pay for. That also can change the competition, right? Because you are looking for a premium price and you you know you have to cover your whole cost over the long term. That's your production, not your marketing, your promotion. So we want to make sure that the time and the investment all makes sense. So there is a nice thing when it comes to being a farmer's market vendor. You having that local market, you don't you don't have to place quite as much emphasis on the competition for price typically. So you don't necessarily have to worry about competing um, or your, your competition is really on quality and value adding and that communication piece as opposed to worrying about being in a commodity market. So that's different. Place, again, your place is pretty much figured out a lot of times, but the things that are important to think about with place are according to cooperative development services representatives, 75% of the direct market customers are going to live within 20 miles of your business slash farmer's market. So either the, the, your place of business, if that is at the farmer's market, or if you're on your farm, if you do on-farm sales. So 75% of the customers will live within 20 miles 
of your sales location. So that's actually, it's, it's good to know that because then we can look at your sales potential when it comes to place. So you know, take out a map and put a little dot on where you sell. Maybe that's multiple places. And then you can put circles around them. I do it like a 25 and a 50 mile radius around your farmer's market. And then from there, you could look at how many towns or cities are within those circles. You could look at the number of households that are in that area or nearby cities where people live and who is going to actually travel to your location. And that will help you figure out what your core potential number of customers is. This can help you figure out what the potential sales per household is. You can look at income levels. You can look at your particular sales related to place if you go to multiple markets. And then through all of this work, <laughs> you can actually look at the number of customers in each of the segments, which in this case might be multiple markets, or if you sell at a farmer's market, but you also do an on-farm CSA, you can say, you know, I travel a half hour, I travel an hour to go sell at a market, but I also do on-farm sales. So that can help you kind of figure out what your, what the projection is going to be for these weekly and monthly and annual purchases that people are making um, of your product. And it really helps think about place also associated with price and what that will look like in the future, how to expand potentially, but we also want to be realistic about this. Um, if you're looking for sources for some of these like purchasing records um, and household information, some of that you can get from census. Sometimes you can find a lot of really good information if you go to the library, but you can also do your own surveys and interviews um, and pulling from these different secondary sources in addition to those primary. So it's really so a little bit of market research that I'm encouraging you to do um, to really get a better idea of what this customer profile is going to look like. So in my example, I know I, I, I'm thinking I have 25 dedicated customers and in a milk example, maybe they're going to buy two gallons of milk a week from me uh, because they're a uh, family of four and one of those gallons is chocolate and we know that they're gonna you know one one white and one chocolate or something and then and then I can say okay oh I have these 25 dedicated customers I know I'm gonna sell at least 50 gallons per week and that we can use that as like a break even and we can base other prices off of this and this again some of a lot of this is just related to place and then what I know the people within that place and those those particular factors, things that I can actually control. Um, and then maybe I know that I need to sell at different markets and that way I can produce a certain amount and, and uh, really have that break even that I need for my particular farmer's market. Now, there's other factors related to place. Some things you can control, some things are out of your control. So thinking about the actual place itself, what is the appearance of a market? What's the appearance of your booth? We'll get to that in another um, in another webinar. Uh, is the market functional? Is your booth functional? So what does it look like for people who walk there? Uh, what's it like for people to park there? Do people with disabilities have access to get to your space? Do people with children, can they get to your space and be, you know, is that accessible for them? And is it safe for them? I've seen some markets that are in spots that they they scream red flags to me. Um, <laughs> but But those are things that you can think about when it comes to place and whether or not there's like a tripping hazard at your booth that maybe you wanna think about. Again, it's a risk management mitigation strategy. Again, some of this thing, some of these you can control and some not so much, but we do what we can with the things that are in place that we can control, right? Um, so with promotion, getting to the last of our P's, 
we the the goal there of course is to increase our sales directly and immediately for whatever that advertised product is so that makes sense for like a grocery store right <laughs> but what does that look like for a farmer's market so if we're trying to gain recognition for ourselves with customers then we want to think about the messaging that we're giving out at the farmer's market out into the community uh, maybe your farmer's market has a Facebook page like was talked about last week a little bit, uh, or maybe you have a Facebook page. And what are those messages that you are sending out into the world to tell people about your farm, the products that you have? And what are the actual advertising tools, which again, we talked about a little bit last week, um, that you're going to put those messages out? Are you using particular images or uh, do you have particular products for your farm that you're focusing on? Because most, a lot of farms are very, very diversified, especially at a farmer's market. Um, but maybe there are certain things that are like, you do those really well and you're going to hone in on them. Uh, what does what does the promotion research look like? Um, so you want to think about an overall approach and what is that concentration for you? That's really building that, the brand for your business that people talk about um, and how to distinguish yourself among that competition. Again, uh, sometimes branding gets particularly expensive, but you don't have to only think about promotion through branding. You can start with just these concepts that people think of when they go to farmers like markets, like you can use the word healthy and you can use the word eco-friendly and locally produced and all of these things that are not regulated terms to promote yourself and start there as you figure out what a brand might be for your particular farm. And because that's not the best route necessarily for a farm at the very, very beginning, if you're trying to figure everything out still, right? It takes time. It takes money to do all these things. I encourage you, I encourage you to brand yourself at some point, but it doesn't have to be the first step for your business. Uh, again, going back to these worksheets that I absolutely love <laughs> uh, for promotion. Again, this worksheet is part of that uh, building a sustainable business guide. I again, check it out. It's really nice to just sit down and write all of the stuff out at one point. Um, but what are these promotions that are also they're they're critical, really, it really is critical for successful marketing, uh, but how to do it with in a way that's going to be affordable especially at a farmer's market, we need to talk about being affordable and efficient and effective with our time. So last week uh, we discussed social media. Uh, there was some website discussion in there a little bit. I know some people really are big fans of brochures and that way you can hand them out to other people hopefully and do a promotion that way. But also at a farmer's market, don't forget about like taste testing. Now, granted, I know uh within the last couple years that was challenging due to covid but most of those i think all of those rules have gone back to the way they were previously so you can offer taste tests again for products at farmers markets it's not it doesn't make sense for everybody but if you have five different types of cheese that you bring to a farmers market yes it is going to make sense to do a taste test <laughs> uh and and then think about these other promotional strategy options that go along with it. What, and and make sure they're paying their way. You know, try them out for a little while, but compare your sales to that strategy. So are you giving out recipe cards to people? Because if so, there's time to print those, there's cost to print those, but if it moves more eggplant that you just love to grow, but people don't know how to cook it, like recipe cards might be worth every single penny, especially if you use those same recipes over and over again. And maybe there's a group that comes and even makes that recipe at your farmer's market. That is just like, ah, that's that's the best. So <laughs> some of these some of these strategies do not have to cost you a ton of money. You don't have to put a billboard up. You don't have to put an advertisement in a newspaper if that doesn't make sense for you. It might make way more sense for your farmer's market. But as an individual vendor, go, go with other low-cost strategies. 
And we want to make sure they fit for your whole farm. So we talk about these as ways to promote individual products, but we also want to make sure it fits within the overall goal of your farm, which is part of the reason why we need to talk about a marketing plan and a business plan overall. So as we do these market analysis, I want you to just be very realistic about the process, um, very realistic about where you live, the time that you have, and the people that you have access to. It's just really important that we, I mean, we get really excited and we shoot for the moon and all of that stuff, but at the same time, be realistic about what it takes to get there. <clears throat> so the marketing plan is not only the physical act of selling, uh, it's also identifying, developing, and retaining those customers. If you're gonna put all the work up front, I mean, it takes a ton of work to get those customers. We wanna make sure they're sticky customers, they come back, they become loyal uh, because it takes a ton of work up front and money and time to get those customers. Make it worth it, bring them back. <laughs> That's the important part. So as we go through developing this plan, step one is going to be listing those products and services. So think about what's going to be the core of your business. Maybe your core product is you produce maple syrup and that's your thing. And that's going to be 80% of your profit is the maple syrup. But maybe you also do some value added stuff. You get into maple cotton candy. You get into maple sugar, maple creams, all these other like maple nuts, all of those things. But the core piece of your business is that 80%. That's going to be that maple syrup. So be be excellent, be excellent at, at your core and, and protect that. Like that is what distinguishes you from your competition in your area. Like that is step one. That's a critical piece here. And then two, I want you to think about that audience and who we are targeting, what those customers look like. Um, because that customer, their, their demographics their psychology and, and their psychographics, that's that's going to depend whether or not they're your customer or they're your neighbor's customer. It's going to tell you what they're buying, what their values are, um, and why they're going to buy one thing over the other. Not every, 100% of the people at the market are not going to be your customer. I'm going to tell you up front, not everybody is your customer, but the ones that keep coming back, like focus on them. Uh, three, analyze your competition. We're gonna look at products and other farms that are like yours, but we wanna also talk about how we're different. Are you offering convenience? Are you offering a different price? Are you offering a similar product that's not the same? Everybody's got tomatoes. Are you offering dehydrated tomatoes? Are you offering canned tomatoes? Like, what does that look like? And then that is gonna be the value and why people are willing to pay more for your product and and you can do a SWOT analysis if, if you want. I encourage you to, if you really feel like it, you can look at the strengths and weaknesses of your business, the opportunities, the threats. It's, it's an internal, alternal. I don't have time to go through all of it, but we can definitely do it. If you want to do a SWOT analysis together, like, let me know. <laughs> we can definitely do that in the future. Uh, four, you also have to think about what's realistic for your budget, because we've talked about some things get real expensive and some things are cheap. Like a lot of times you start with the cheap stuff and move up, but do what makes sense for your business and the resources that you have, uh, because it's going to change the time and energy and really the effectiveness of the strategy that you pick as we move forward. Uh, and then five, like pick those marketing plans and do them. Like it, we can talk all day about planning and planning and planning, but you actually have to do the thing or do the things to make all of this work and build into your business plan. Um, the planning is nothing without action, right? So the strategies will change as your business changes. We know that businesses are never, are, shouldn't, not, shouldn't be static. They should be fluid as the world around you changes, you have to grow. Um, so a marketing plan and a business plan, they, think of them as living documents. They need to grow. They need to mature. And if you've got to pivot because things like COVID happens, you're going to pivot or your business is not going to be there in a couple of years. And we saw a lot of examples of that in, in the last couple of years. 
So real quick, uh, the Lean Canvas. This is an example of how to think about your business. It's one example. There is no single format out there or right way to make a business plan or a marketing plan. It has to make sense for you. It has to be tailored to you. So for the sake of time, I'm not gonna go through a 15 page business plan. I'm gonna give you a very simplistic template that I encourage you just to check out because it's supposed to take 20 minutes. It was designed to take 20 minutes. And because I'm already running out of time, I'm gonna have to race through it. So we'll see how quick we can get through this. <laughs> but this is a lean business model and I'm putting a link for where you can find this into the chat box now. And that way you can reference it or again, make your own. That's perfectly fine too. But this encourages you to think about it's critical thinking and not only number crunching because we've already talked about that a little bit. Um, it's the critical thinking pieces. So it's broken down into nine segments. Number one and number two, honestly, you can interchange. You can look at prom problems. You can look at customer segments. For, for this particular case, for farmer's markets, I encourage you to look at customer segments first. But the standard for quite a while has been looking at problems first because that's generically how a business works within your community. So if we look at problems first, what is the need? What is the problem that your customer has? So there are things on the left-hand side, those are the problems. On the right-hand side are a handful of example solutions. That's really gonna help you find your niche. So that's part of the reason why we wanna look at your customers. Are your customers coming to the farmer's market because they have health concerns? Like I remember going to the farmer's market and walking through the aisles while I was doing my checks, and a guy said, you know, I am recovering from cancer, so I'm coming here because I'm looking for certified organic product, and I'm looking for things that have more nutrients in them. Like he had a significant health concern. Uh, are people coming to you because it's more affordable? Is it because you offer something that's culturally appropriate? Not everywhere can you buy organ meats. Like it's harder to get in certain areas. Um, so what are those things that you're offering? What's the problem that you are filling? So what do, what does the customer want? How are they wanting it? When are they wanting it? Those are all related to the problems. So for me, it's convenience. Like what can I get a convenience food, right? Um, and then what are the existing alternatives? Again, I've got a reference for that book that I love. So, but um, what is the existing alternative? Who is your competition? And again, we've already talked about part of this. If you see how the four Ps fit naturally right into your business plan that is directly marketing plan into business plan. They work together in harmony. Um, and then who are the early adopters for your product? What problems are you solving that people are like, oh man, I've got to get on that because they've got organic asparagus or you have a specialty grain that we don't get to see at farmer's markets very often. Those people are probably going to be your early adopters because they, they are desperate for your product. So customer segments, that's the next, that's the next section we're gonna go to. Again, they're interchangeable. And 100% of those customers, we know what I say, they're not, 100% of the people at the market are not your customers. They're not there for your particular business, but that's okay, because we're gonna segment those people out and we're gonna say, how are you different? Do you have a greenhouse? So you have tomatoes in March and green tomatoes. Do you have a high tunnel? So you have those, like maybe you're really into growing cherry tomatoes and you have a ton of cherry tomatoes in April because you have a high tunnel. Or maybe you're the field grown person with tomatoes in August, but you're gonna grow heirlooms. Nobody else has those beautiful chocolatey striped tomatoes. That's your thing. Like how, what are the customers looking for that you, that are gonna make sense for your business? And then we already talked about looking at some background information, what are some industry trends, consumer trends, all those good things, um, and looking at what, what would be a description for the farmer's market that you go to, and then the households that are there, again, are they individuals, are they families, is it lower income, what, how are we segmenting those people out, and then what are some assumptions that we're going to make of how those customers 
influence the overall business. <clears throat> so unique value proposition. That's a pretty key piece. It is what makes you different. And I think I've already said this, but the unique value proposition or statement is why people are going to pay for your product. So maybe it's that grass fed milk from those particular cows and your product is specific or is special because it is grass fed and locally produced and that's what your customers are looking for. So that's what makes you unique, truly unique. You're a small farmer, you're local, maybe you have a particular wonderful reputation, your customer service is amazing, or you're just filling the need for the customer because they don't have time to do something in particular, or you're appealing to them because they're environmentally conscious or something. So those are, again, relates to customer segment, relates to the promotion, the four Ps, the whole marketing plan, it all works together. There is a high level concept for all of this as well. I personally don't feel like it makes nearly as much sense for a farmer's market, but I guess it does. So like a high tunnel tomato, it's like a field grown tomato, but it's available in April. So it's just this, it, it's a, it's an X, Y analogy that mo that businesses can use. Farms can definitely use it too. Um, but if you're looking at individual individual products at a market, in my opinion, it doesn't make as much sense as it does. Like if we're talking about the alien movie is like the Jaws movie, but in space. Yeah, that's what that's high level concept. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on that um, for solutions. Again, if we look at where we were with problems, the solution that you're offering, because my problem is I need convenience. Maybe you're bringing a par baked bread to the farmer's market uh, because my problem is I need something affordable. Maybe your solution is you do bulk purchasing of those tomatoes that everyone has uh, and you're offering bushel baskets and maybe even pre-ordering bushel baskets so you don't have to bring tons of bushels to the market. But think about like how those solutions relate to the problems that we discussed and what is the customer say they need versus what they actually need. And that the reference here that everybody always uses is Henry Ford's response to customers' perceptions of wanting a faster horse, he made a vehicle, right? So what are those unique solutions that you specifically can offer through your farm? Um, channels, because we talk about this quite a bit and it was covered a lot last week, I'll be very brief. Um, this was also discussed under the four P's of promotion, that portion. So what are we doing to reach those audiences? How do we pull them into our business? It might be that social media piece. It might be advertising. But also, how do you push yourself out into those communities? Uh, do you follow up with people? Do you have a particular connection to people? Are you putting out ads? Um, depending on your business, maybe you also set up at county fairs or conferences or whatever. Like, so think about the in versus the out for your business and make sure you build that into your marketing plan. And that will directly affect costs, of course, but it can also affect revenue. Um, revenue we discussed already under the price section, but that really has to do with your market potential. That size of the market, how many vendors are there, which can go both ways, like having more vendors can be good, especially if they're diversified. Uh, and then the number of customers that come to the market, if you track that, uh, if you have like a point of sales option for your booth, you can look at the transactions that come in, or if you just write the transactions down on a piece of paper, then you have a better idea of one, you know, you know, the income and the revenue, but two, you can look at transactions, which is really helpful, but that's something that your farmer's market can also track. And I encourage them to track the number of people that come through, because then you can compare like what your sales look like versus the number of people that go through the market overall. <laughs> it's a lot of math. I get it. Um, but, you know, everybody eats, but people can only consume so much product before things start getting wasted. So, thinking about our revenue, you can diversify your product by changing the sizes of your 
quantity? Are you selling to individuals? Are you selling to big families? And then that is one way to really boost that revenue stream, right? So for costs associated with that, this of course is a critical piece to a business plan. <laughs> it's not only about the output, but or the input, uh, it's also the output. Uh, this can be historical production if you've been in business for a while, or you could ask your competition about some of their costs. Most people are willing to talk about, you know, the price of inputs that particular year and how, uh, <laughs> well, depending on, depending on what you're into, they'll talk about how the, the price of pesticides have gone up or fertilizer has gone up and all that good stuff. Um, so costs, a lot of times, extension and USDA, lots of people have different cost breakdowns. This book also has a cost sheet, page 197, has some really good examples of expenses that you can think of, specifically for markets, but also your overall business, because again, all works together in tandem. Uh, and then what does that look like over multiple years? Then we can talk about cash flow, um, and all of this is definitely important. There are additional sheets that we could go over, but I don't have time to today. Um, if we want to talk about balance sheets, again, if these are topics that you want us to go over in the future, just let us know and we will. That's perfectly fine. But it is a little more hands-on than I feel like going over during all of this. Um, but any anyway, the, the point is that all farms have risks and all we are trying to do is mitigate some of that by saying, what are our costs? Have we thought about what happens if, like in this year, because of the weather that we've been having, including today, I'm in Morgantown, uh, the smoke cover outside today is still pretty high. Um, that is influencing our temperature. It's going to influence how your crops grow. Uh, hopefully we don't end up with the same type of natural disasters that some of our neighbors are going through right now. But these are all unpredictable things when it comes to price that we receive. And that goes back into your costs. Like how are we, how are we going to handle costs? Are we getting crop insurance? Are we planning on diversifying our business a particular way? So there's a couple formulas here that I encourage you to look at when it comes to thinking about your particular price. And it's unlikely that you're going to sell 100% of what you take to the farmer's market. If you do, that's excellent, but it's not a guarantee. So how is that also going to influence your price and your gross sales? <clears throat> so think about that too. Uh, key metrics is just those numbers that we think of to tell us what success looks like. And that goes into your overall plan. What does success look like for you? So Maybe it is at the beginning of the season, what does the progress look like towards creating your booth? And then what does during the season it look like for your success? Maybe you're thinking about traffic to your booth or customer transactions or the pounds of produce that you're moving. So those, all of those techniques or all of those figures, those scenarios fall under key metrics. And then finally, your unfair advantage, the thing that cannot be copied or bought that you and you alone offer to the community. So this could be the relationships that you have with people because your customer service is just wonderful. You're super friendly, you're patient, you're professional, you're organized, you've got great communication skills. Like what are those things that you offer that nobody else offers because that's you. Like maybe you're a really great salesman and you just have this wonderful, like every single time you say, I'll see you next week. That brings those customers back and also shows you're friendly. Lots of people in West Virginia are super friendly, but just like think about that and use it as part of your sales piece because people love it. It makes people regulars when you know their names, especially if you say, oh, you know, how? what did you think about the mushrooms that I sold you last week? Like, how did you use those? Those are, and it's also really good feedback to see how people are using your products. And then you can use that as a reference when other folks ask, how do I use eggplant, you know? <laughs> uh, 
So, so these are these are all the pieces of that canvas that are are to be thought about. And supposedly it takes about 20 minutes to make a really, really high level, and I've done it in 10, uh, to really make a high level business plan. You don't have to go into all the little tiny nitty gritty details, but but I encourage you to look at that canvas, go through all of the little pieces here and there, just do one really simplistic one, especially because we're in the middle of the season, and just just think about it for for that 10 minutes, take 10 minutes out of your day and do it. Um, and then come back to me and let me know what the process was like. <laughs> and I'll help you go through it if you wish. We can definitely do that together. I've done them I've done them for years now. Um, and and I just remember again, it's a work in progress. It's nothing that's ever final. So take that particular pressure off. It allows you to pivot that business to respond to interesting trends that might bring you more revenue. Uh, and then and then thinking about those trends, you can look at magazines and Nielsen reports, extension updates, puts them out sometimes. Um, I know I've written a couple articles about food trends and I've actually seen some of the food trends even go in place. Like in the 2020, 21, I was writing about mushrooms. And now I'm seeing more mushroom producers in the state, which is really, really exciting to see that some of those trends are happening. Um, oh, so, so for this year, if you've already seen some interesting trends emerge at your market or just in general, I would love for you to put that in the chat box um, just to talk about, are you seeing more people Maybe you are seeing the mushrooms pop up in your area, or maybe someone in your area has started selling lentils or chickpeas or something really unique. Um, I would love to hear what's happening in your local communities as part of these next steps. So if you have questions or comments, I would love to address them. Again, um, there's a handful of those excellent resources in the chat box that I would love for you to save to your computer or you follow up with me, we'll send those examples out. I can send PDFs out. Uh, and then if you, again, to come to that workshop, I'll give out some books to people if you're interested. So feel free to ask questions related to marketing and business planning. You can come off mute if you want and just chit chat. But I do wanna be cognizant of everybody's time that I've spoken too much and it is the end of, <laughs> it is the end of my hour, but I will stay, I will stay on.